I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stay like this and then I will uh, put back the slides in a moment, okay? No, but I think, uh, actually, no, I think we can start. Yeah? Yeah, most, most of the people are here already, yes. Uh, you tell me when, uh, I, I guess you have to start the recording anyway, so. Okay. So we can start again. <laughs> So our next speaker for today is uh, Giovanni Pizzi from uh, Laboratory of Theory and Simulation of Materials at PFL, Switzerland, and the uh, National Center for Computational Design and Discovery of Novel Materials. Uh, he will give us a lecture and uh, gets a short hands-on on thermoelectric and electronic pr transport properties with Vanier 90 and, and Boltzmann. So Giovanni is actually also director of the of the workshop. He will uh, he will join us in presence next week for for the developers meeting. So thanks Giovanni for preparing this and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot Antimo and uh, thanks everybody again. Sorry that I cannot be there in person with you but uh, I'm happy that I can also have a chance to tell you a bit about uh, how you can compute uh, properties connected to electronic transport and thermoelectric properties with uh, with uh, Vanier 90. So you can see another, actually this will be an excuse to also discuss a bit more about uh, generic interpolation of properties and uh, operators in the variant zone beyond uh, the bond structure. But since again, the focus is mostly on the thermoelectric properties, uh, maybe just one slide of motivation, which is uh, why thermoelectric is so important. And is that, as you know, ma many, many applications have a lot of wasted energy as heat. You will heat up, uh, your computer heats up, your lights heat up, etc. Your car engine heats up. And all this energy just is wasted. And if you have a thermoelectric device that you can couple to it, and so you have a hot and a cold area, and this can be converted back into electricity, you can use it to charge a battery and to avoid, to reduce at least the waste. Now, in order to make this efficient, you need something which is efficient in converting back temperature differences across the material into electricity, to energy. And you can work out the equations that define essentially the efficiency of such a material. And it turns out the, the efficiency is related, it's not proportional, it's a function of this ZT quantity you see here, uh, which is a, co a linear quantity. There's a combination, as a, for a formula, which depends on the electroconductivity of the material, on the Seebeck coefficient, on the temperature, so the, the efficiency will depend also at which temperature you're working, and on the electronic and lattice thermal conductivity, in general, the thermal conductivity of the material. And as you can imagine, if your material which is, uh, conducts heat very, very fast, that's bad, uh, because it but will wash out this temperature difference. And, but you have a, a complex interplay. Okay? You, typically, these quantities are also interconnected. So it's not obvious to get something where this specific product and ratio is high. Uh, so you want, I didn't mention, you want this ZT to be high, to be large. Um, because when you increase the, conduct the electronic conductivity, also the, uh, you know, the thermal conductivity of the electron will go up, and also the Seebeck coefficient is related to these quantities. So, you say in practice, this quantity is eight dimensional. If you put in the units, you get a high dimensional number. And you want something which is at least two or three, something, so two, three would be large already in this context, in order to have something efficient. But the best materials are more around one, and these already are the best performing ones. And so, that's a bit the quest for thermoelectric is to find something which essentially has, if you want a, uh, a very high electronic conductivity, a very low thermal conductivity and a relatively good uh, coefficient when the operating conditions. And so in order to do this, one way to do it is to do simulations of materials. Uh, maybe you take um, a family of materials, you take a database, you start computing these quantities. And you, once you do it, you, you can try to figure out if there is a material you know, or you can optimize a material that doesn't exist yet, in order to get a very high ZT. And so the quantities you have to compute are written here. And in, what we will focus are actually these three, sigma, electrical conductivity, S, C, the coefficient, and the electronic contribution to the thermal conductivity, K, E. Actually, one has to remember that at least if you work at room temperature or let's say large temperatures, the lattice contribution, the phonon contribution, if you want, the, the atomic contribution to the 
thermal conductivity is typically the most important one. And so actually what we will get is a kind of a limit, a bounder uh, for this quantity, but you have to consider that the actual property you will put into your, uh, which would characterize your material will depend a lot on, on both. So if you get something where you really manage to send this quantity to a very low or zero, that's great. And what we compute is kind of the, the best you can get. But in real material, it would even be worse. But just to, this is just to stress, you know, KL is actually very important in applications. We will be computing mostly this part because this requires computing electron phonon scattering. And we see this actually in the afternoon. So, but now this is a Vanier school. So why are we discussing this in the context of uh, Vanier functions? And the reason is that the key ingredients that we see in a moment, I will show you the equations that bring us to how we can compute these quantities. The key ingredient, the key function you have in, in your formulas is something which is called a transport distribution function or TDF for short, which will indicate to this capital sigma letter, which is a tensor depending on I and J, so two bands, and is an energy, it depends on the energy, it's kind of a density of state. You see here you have a delta over the energy, which typically you then use mirror out with some Gaussian. So it's very similar to a uh, to density of states. If you want, actually, if you remove this part, it will be exactly the density of states, but it's actually a weighted density of states, which contains the velocities and a scattering time. So in particular, this tau is what's called a relaxation time. Is a fun in, in general, it's a function of the band in the k-point. It tells you a typical time in which an electron in a given band will be scattered by you know, electron phonon scattering or anything else into something else, something in picoseconds and seconds. Then the other important ingredient is, and this will be one of the reasons why we use many when, when functions, is the band velocity. And the band velocity is relatively simple. It's just essentially the derivative of your band structure in k space. So this will be your k axis, this is your energy, this will be your bands. If you take a point and you do the partial derivatives apart from a factor h bar, this gives you something which is the units of velocity. And in a quasi classical approximation, you can really think to it as the velocity an electron has if it is exactly in the specific point in the bands. And the other important thing to remember, as I mentioned, this is a numerically very close to computing a density of states. It's a sum over all bands of delta functions <coughs> over the energy. And so you really need a very high and dense mesh of k-points in order to get something smooth. As you see here, I have a kind of little animation where you start from something where you have a lot but not enough k-points to get something very noisy. And really you have to go to, you know, maybe 100 by 100 by 100 for k-points to really have something smooth. So all of this, makes it very exciting and interesting to use by the functions for two reasons. As I'm going to mention in a moment, on one side, you can compute these velocities analytically. Analytically means that typically, if you have a bound structure, you can compute the differences, but in a finite difference approach, right? You would take the band here, the band in a closed by point, do a finite difference, you define the velocity, which means that A, you have to compute multiple points, but also B, if you have a crossing, you make, make mistakes. Okay, you can maybe get a velocity which is wrong because you're taking this band and this band when in reality you want to follow this band. Analytically means you really give <coughs> when in 90 a k point and it will not only tell you, okay, these are the energies, but in the same calculation, we will also tell you these are the velocities in this point. We will tell you to look at the neighboring points. And the other thing as you will now, by now know is that the efficient interpolation at uh, when a function will give you. So you can really you do, I don't know, an eight by eight by eight k-point mesh in reciprocal space with DFT. And then once you have a, a converged Vanier function basis that you have a real space Hamiltonian, your interpolated band structure can be done very fast in a very, very dense mesh. Putting these things together, this makes them exactly very attractive to use this to compute uh, this quantities in a very converged way. Of course, one caveat is that you need to first find the Vanier function. So this is a something else to take into account. And very often this, as you saw before, uh, requires human time, requires to understand what the Vanier functions are. <coughs> Sorry. Even if you saw that, especially on Wednesday, there are nowadays a number of methods to make this process as automated as possible. So I wanted to briefly give you an idea of theory, how we get to these formulas, how we get to this uh, 
transfer distribution function. You will see then after you understand this, the actual code, the actual simulation you have to run is very, very simple. It's essentially a standard organization with uh, one more run with three, five flags. It's very simple. So the tutorial will be almost me showing you and you will see this. It's not complicated, but I want to tell you a bit more about the theory. So you start from uh, a function which gives you the distribution in phase space of your uh, electron. So we'll tell you what's the probability of finding an electron with a given position and a given k vector, essentially velocity in a sense, at a given time. So this, way, this quantity is the number of electrons at a given time in a little dr dk in phase space. And as soon as you put some perturbing effect, this distribution is not anymore the equilibrium distribution, which we call f of zero, like a you know, uh, Fermi Dirac distribution of electrons. Because say, if you put an electric field, for instance, you might shift electrons on one side of your sample. If you put a, a local heat, this local heat will increase some population on one side of the sample and reduce it. So we need to remember that there are these two quantities we call f zero the equilibrium one. I remove all fields, I remove everything, this is the equilibrium one, and then a local perturbation of it. The other thing to remember is there is a theorem, you will you will theorem, which tells you that essentially if there are no collisions, you have in total the volume in phase space will be conserved. Your particle will move, so maybe what you have in a given position and a given velocity, after some time we go away. You change the velocity, so you change the position, and this will move out but the volume which is occupied will be conserved uh, in time. However, if you have collisions, you have a, con a contribution which changes the actual number of electrons in space. And you can imagine, okay, you have a particle with a given velocity and position, this will move. At some point it hits something, it will jump. It will, the position will stay the same, but the velocity will jump to something else. It will revert the velocity and go away. So really have, if you look at, uh, what happens in a given position in phase space at some point of some particle which essentially disappear because it goes somewhere else. And it's given by a rate of collisions. The more often this collision can happen, the more we, the, 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 the number of electrons on average will change over time. And you can write out explicitly this uh, derivative as a partial derivative. Okay, you have the actual change of f over time plus a contribution which is the fact that you have a velocity, so particles will move away, plus have a fact you have some forces, and so these forces will change the velocity of your particles. So you see, essentially, what you're saying is that the rate you have will be related to uh, a number of components which depend on the velocity and the forces of your system. And this is what is called the Boltzmann transport equation, which will be the basic equation we will use uh, now to get a numerical expressions we can use to compute uh, the transport coefficients. So let me write it again. That's a full Boltzmann transport equation, but still it's very generic. Now we don't know yet, we didn't say what the forces are in the system, we didn't say anything about uh, the F, and we didn't say anything about how collisions work in the material. So now we start doing some approximations to try to get an equation which you can describe our problem and we can compute. The first thing is we will assume uh, that any perturbation you put, uh, temperature gradient, or uh, an electric field in the system will be small. So it will, yes, perturb your system. You put an electric field, your electron will have a velocity to try to drift in one direction. You put a, a heat difference in the two ends of a bar, uh, they will have a slightly different you know, equilibrium uh, Fermi Dirac distribution, but this will be always small. And if they're small, F is close to F zero, the equilibrium one. And so the derivative can be essentially approximated with a essentially the derivative will be minus the difference in distribution over a time. And this time we do an even stronger approximation, which in general is not very justified, but it works fine in most cases where we say this time doesn't depend on anything except uh, it's a constant essentially. Whatever you are in space, wherever you are on the bands, it's a time, which tells you, tells you on average, if you have an electron, how quickly it will be scattered. And actually, what you to interpret this time, you can say, okay, let's take a system. I remove any forces, I remove any electric field, I remove any gradient of F, so essentially I remove any temperature gradient. I just take a 
constant temperature bar no fields. What happens? It happens that the solution of the equation now becomes that the distribution of electrons, F, is nothing else than uh, the equilibrium distribution, what I would get if I leave it there forever, plus if I have a change, I make a little perturbation, I hit locally something, this will go down the equilibrium distribution with an exponential, and the typical time is tau. Okay, so imagine you take a bar, you locally hit the sample, you remove the heat, this will, the distribution of electrons, the term, we go back to the Fermi Dirac at zero, with this type characteristic time. Constant means it doesn't depend on space, it doesn't depend on the uh, bond structure. In reality, as we'll see this afternoon, this is actually a function of k, so you will want to consider it. But in this today, for, for what we discussed now, um, we assume that a constant. And we see it's relatively easy once you have a way to compute this tau with electron form of scattering, for instance, or any other scattering you have in the system to put into an equation. So now we have the full equation. We already said how we can write this kind of very generic term. Uh, let's do a few more approximations. First of all, we assume the material is homogeneous. You don't have different materials, so all the, the gradients are zero over space. And we assume there is an electric field, but it's steady. It's not an oscillating field over time. So the explicit partial derivative of f over t is zero. We have a field, we create some, something, but the partial derivative is zero. And the force we decide is specifically to put an electric field. So the force is just the electric field times the charge. A constant one, okay, because in the end it's what we will have. Okay, we want, want to see if by having a heat difference we create a constant field in the sample. We write the current now, this is a standard equation to write the current as the sum of all electrons you have, this a normalization times their velocity times their distribution. It's nothing really fancy, it's just the current is the number of particles times charge times velocity. And we know that the current is connected to, actually this point is a definition of the conductivity of a material. The conductivity sigma is nothing else than the tensor connecting the current with the field. And once you have this, you just work it out. You put all the pieces together. I won't do it explicitly here. But essentially you get an expression by just replacing things, which gives you an expression of the conductivity tensor, sigma ij, as a function of a number of things. It will be a function of some constants, the constant transition uh, time, being constant in width out of the sum, if it were dependent on the band, it would have been here, a sum over all bands of the velocity of the bands and a derivative of the distribution function. So in general, we the derivative of the Fermi Dirac distribution function because we're speaking of electrons. And the final step is to rewrite this expression in terms of what I defined before, the transport distribution function. And Formally, it's trivial in the sense I'm just taking this part, I multiply by a delta over the energy and I integrate over all energies. So it's very simple. If I replace this in here, integral over delta will go away. We're just giving back the same formula. But it's very convenient because what I will do this is I will compute this quantity, not anymore as a function of k points, but as a function of energy of a single variable, like a density of states. And then I can just integrate this extended density of states with some shape, with some uh, function, and I, I get my, my, my transport coefficient. And as you will see, we similar, actually the next slide, once you compute it once, you can easily compute all other quantities. You can use, instead of using as before, J equal to sigma E, you can start imagining you also have a gradient in temperature. You can write a more general expression for the current and for the charge, for the heat current, this is again essentially the definition of sigma, the definition of the Seeber coefficient, the definition of the thermal conductivity. You put them in, you use the definition of sigma, and you see that also not only the definition of sigma, but also the definition of S, or actually sigma S, and the definition of K, uh, the thermal conductivity, are a very simple expression. Actually, that the zero, one, and second momentum of the sigma with some prefactor. So practically speaking, as long as I'm able to compute this, compute the velocities, multiply by some constant time, do a dense interpolation, I get this function as a function of, uh, of uh, energy. And then it's just a matter of doing one dimensional integrals, something everybody can do essentially numerically to get all these properties. But there is one 
important thing. Let's say the ingredients are the band energies because you need it in order to do this delta. And this we know how to call this. This is a band structure interpolation with an energies. We need the band velocities. As I said, it's something we can actually uh, do analytically. I'll show you the next slide. It should be an analysis grid, but also there is this factor which we didn't discuss explicitly yet. But as I said, F is your Fermi Dirac, which will look like this as a function of energy, it goes from one to zero with some spread, which is essentially KT, the temperature at which you are. If you do a derivative, you can imagine it is at zero, 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 the here is zero, oh, sorry. And only in here, so here is flat, here is flat, so the derivative is zero. And essentially the derivative is not a Gaussian, but looks like a Gaussian, let's say, is something which is very peaked around the chemical potential of a width of KT, the width of the temperature at which you are. Which means that in reality, this integral is doing nothing else than sampling sigma, the transport distribution function, or sigma times some moment, only very close to the Fermi energy. Okay, so what it actually matters, it doesn't matter what you have very high in energy or very low in energy, it only matters what you have in a KT range around your, Fermi, your chemical potential. Okay, let's go quick. So now in y value functions, this will go very quickly. It's one slide just to remember what you already saw this week. So you have a way to convert your block states into with some unitary transformation and some uh, iterative procedure to get the unitary matrix into local value functions. And then you get something which is localized in space. And probably this you already saw, when you have the ab initio one structure, this is a material which we may be studying because it's an interesting thermoelectric material, you would compute your band structure with DFT only on certain points, okay, only a four by four by four grid. This would be your green circles here. If you don't have any functions, it's very hard to know what is, you know, if the band is going like this or it's going flat, and this will, of course changes a lot when you do velocities, okay. If you just want to do the density of states, maybe it's okay, but as soon as you need the velocities, you know, so the band starts like this, your velocity will be negative instead of positive, which completely changes the behavior. But if you use many functions, you get a very fast and efficient interpolation, which actually you can check with DFT. So this is if the black one are binary functions interpolated one structure, and there the red is very expensive DFT and SCF calculations. And you see this reproduce exactly your one structure. So you have a, a you reproduce an anti-crossing, reproduce if there is a crossing, and so on. And this is very efficient. Actually, if you do in this material. The, the math, you have to take a big node to do the a K point in uh, 30 seconds. But if you do any functions, every K point will take, you know, tens of milliseconds. So it's really, you know, orders of magnitude faster once you have any functions. And as I said, it's actually a paper written by Jonathan, David, and, uh, and Ivo and co workers. Uh, you can compute analytically the, the, the derivatives. And the reason is that you know, if you have your many functions, what you get in the procedure is essentially these matrix elements, which are the Hamiltonian matrix elements, the hopping between two and a functions in two different sides. And to get an interpolated uh, band structure, what you do is essentially to take these hoppings, do a Fourier transform essentially, it's a Fourier interpolation, and you get the Hamiltonian every key point, you analyze it, and you get your bands. But in reality, you can interpolate essentially any operator, and in particular, the Fourier transform on the derivative is multiplying by R in reciprocal space. So if you actually do the Fourier interpolation, not of the hopping, but the hopping times IR, and you're clever in the way you diagonalize this, you put the U matrices, what you actually get is exactly the derivative. So in this sense, this is what it means making a analytical, or any analytically the velocities. It means that you don't have to do finite differences, but once you have these matrix elements, which you have from one yet, not only you can interpolate the bands, diagonalize and get the energies, but you can also multiply by R, do it again, and what you get directly at that K point are the velocities for each band. This is implemented in value 90. Actually, you can get this just the velocities with a module which is called gen interp for general interpolator. It's part of post 90 but what we will do today is to use it as part of uh, um, of the Boltzmann code, which is also a sub-module of post w 90 uh, to obtain directly the, the transport, transport distribution function and, it, and the transport coefficients. Very briefly, I wanted to show you the theory is over. I want to show a bit an example of uh, two slightly complex but scientifically relevant cases, which actually 
showed in this paper, which we, where we have present both the code and its examples. Uh, just to give a sense of what we can do, and then we go into the tutorial where we do only silicon, something very simple, because for the point of the tutorial, we just want to understand how it works. But anyway, it can allow us to think a bit and uh, ask questions and try to understand better. So one very interesting material, very well-known material, is uh, this cobalt triantimonide. It's a material which at DFT has a number of valence bands and conduction bands. It's a very tiny gap, at least in LDA. Um, here is you see, uh, this is the structure and uh, some information on the structure. And essentially here, the bottom one are very down. As you remember, we look at something very close to Fermi energy. So we only care about states here. We don't care about states very down because this derivative of the Fermi Dirac will send a contribution to zero. So we'll exclude this in the calculation from the functions. These are essentially S orbitals on the antimonide. And we, this is the variation we can do. We get, we use this frozen window, we use this outer window, and essentially we use P-like when a function on SB, D-like when a function on cobalt, and this is the kind of uh, interpolation we get, which is quite good because we get very well the, all the valence bands and very well also the bottom part of the conduction band, which is more than enough because you know this is like two electron volts and room temperature, we care only about a few kT, which is a few hundreds of milliliter volts. So this is more than enough, even if the spans are not accurate, we don't care. And these are a bit the numbers which we, we, we use. The where you see essentially we, we use a six by six by six for each density, only a four by four by four NSCF to do the functions. But then we can quickly interpolate with Vanier on a 40 by 40 by 40 K mesh to do the transport distribution functions. And these are the kind of plots we produce. Okay. Here you see the sigma, the electrical conductivity, the Seabird coefficient, and the electrical con the, sorry, thermal conductivity as a function of the chemical potential, where if you look at it again, I didn't put a zero, sorry, but the gap is here around eight point something, so the gap is here. And so this will allow you also to investigate not only what happens in the neutral material, where essentially you have zero conductivity because you have a, a semiconductor, right? So unless you increase the temperature, you have all the valence bands filled, all the conduction balance empty, so we have very low conductivity. But if you start to dope the material, you move the Fermi level into the conduction band, which is an end doping, into the balance band with the P doping, so increase the conductivity. And you have interesting effects also as a function of the chemical potential at a given temperature on S and thermal conductivity. As you see here, we have curves that are function of the temperature. And what we did in this paper was a comparison of our results with a reference code, which is called Bolt Trap, which is uh, well known. It's uh, here is your reference, and it does it has some tricks to do the derivatives numerically on the band structure while using variant functions. So it doesn't require variant function, but of course uh, uh, requires a very expensive NSF calculation on a relatively dense field. So it was a, this was mostly for the paper, but just to show that our code works fine. And it's comparable to other codes. Just as a curiosity, there's a different material. It's a very similar, but instead of being cobalt antimonide, it's cobalt germanium and S and sulfur. And again, a check to show that the two codes give the same result. Uh, one final thing I wanted to show is that here you see things as a function of the chemical potential, which is something that theoretically is easy to compute, is one of your variables. If you remember in equations, here we have a the chemical potential as a variable. But in experiments, you don't know the chemical potential, right? You know the doping of your particular. And so what you can do, you can get the density of states. You can convert a doping level in centimeters to the minus three into the position the chemical potential will have at a temperature. That's something relatively easier to integrate, Rever invert the integral of the density of states. And then you can co convert uh, you can make a plot uh, where instead of having on the x-axis the um, chemical potential, you have something experimentally measurable, which is the doping of the material. So essentially, that's the kind of plot you can get. As a function of temperature, you can fix a doping level based on say, an experimental sample. And then you can, given, given the doping and the temperature, you can get what is the chemical potential, go back in the plot before and show it. And what you see here, the, the lines are what we get through this approach from the Boltzmann calculation in a very simple constant relaxation time approximation. The dots are data from experiments. 
And you see that in the end, uh, it's not perfect. Again, we're using a very naive uh, approximation, constant relaxation time, so a high temperature that doesn't work very well. But in the end, it's not bad. You, know, you can really get a bit the qualitative behavior of this curves, and also quantitatively, it's not completely wrong. And one thing to remember is that since we are looking only at KT close to the chemical potential, it doesn't matter so much in the end if the LDA gap is incorrect. As long as you open it a bit, you will typically be looking if you have a high P-doping or a high N-doping, we'll mostly be looking only at the conduction band, only at the valence band. So in the end, you can essentially imagine to do a sister correction, only look at those. The error on the gap is not so important. What will matter, actually will matter only for here at high temperature where you start having transitions directly between the valence and the conduction. But what will matter is really the shape of the balance functions, of the band structure, sorry. And of course, if you have advanced methods, you have GW methods or advanced methods to get better band structure, this will be even more accurate with the same approach. So let me summarize a bit this theory, and then I will just spend a few minutes to introduce you to the tutorial. Vari90 has a module which is called Boltzmann, which is part of post 90 which allows you to compute electronic and thermal conductivity Civet coefficient in the constant relaxation time approximation. Actually, it works, I didn't mention, also for spin polarized systems. And even if it's a constant relaxation time, it, the code, the time only appears in one place. So it's, if you have a model for your time as a function of the band structure, it's easy to adapt it. And as I showed before, the code works well and can be cross verified against another code. An advantage of using, so the both doesn't use binary functions, so the idea was to implement the same theory in a linear based uh, um, approach. And the, the advantage is that once you have the binary functions, interpolation is super fast, band velocities are calculated analytically, and since it's implemented as a post processing of binary 90, essentially it works like transparent with essentially any DFT code which is interfaced with binary 90. You don't need to have one implementation for each DFT code, you just implement it for many 90 As long as you can get the many functions from any code, you can then compute uh, uh, this transport, this, this transport coefficients. Now, this concludes the theory. Let me briefly have a few slides to tell you a bit how it works in practice. And my goal is not to um, not to give you a to show how it works because you will see it's really really straightforward. You have the PDF, so you can go through it in the next uh, you now. 25 minutes because I need five more minutes. <clears throat> but you will see the first part, we're going to use silicon. It's the simplest system. So you know exactly how to binarize it. We'll find all the files, but you know, I guess you did already a few times by now. So you have to do the standard SCF and SCF, PW290, disentanglement and binarization. Uh, as you saw, we typically might, want be, might be interested also in knowing what happens in the conduction band. That's why we do have to do a disentanglement. We need to have a good description also of the bottom of the conduction band, especially if you want to do um, N doping in the material. And so since we want these eight many functions, as you probably already saw for silicon, we want to use a sp3 initial projections on the two silicon atoms in the unit cell. This, you know, you just will do it, but it's really you know, pressing a button. The final thing is running a final executable called postw 90 which was already introduced on Monday. Uh, We'll use the same input file as by 90, but we'll take an you know, all between 30 seconds and two minutes with the inputs we gave you. If you do in serial, it's going to be probably two or three minutes. If you go in parallel, it should take 30 seconds in your virtual machine. Where we tell exactly, please use Boltzmann, please compute these quantities. Okay. The input is the same. It just has an additional part, which I'm showing here, and you will have the files in the GitHub, which contains the flags for Boltzmann. So what you have to say is that, first of all, you want to say, I want to use Boltzmann, okay? So you want to enable this module because Postal 90 allows to use a lot of modules. If you don't put it or you put to false, these variables are all ignored and Postal 90 will do nothing. And once you put it true, you have to say a few things. Uh, first thing, as we discussed, once you compute on a very dense grid, energies and velocities, Computing the density of states is for free. So even if there are modules to compute dots already in, uh, in positive 90, we have a flag to ask Boltzmann to compute directly the dots because it's a zero cost. And so it doesn't make sense to have another module which we do the sum computation. 
And so you, if you want it, it's not compulsory, but put it to true. And then you have to say the energy step, the energy grid on which you compute the steady states. In this case, there are, uh, you, you can go in the in the um, documentation, it will tell you all the units, but these are electron volts. So it means a, a grid of 10 million electron volts under the density of states. You want to do a Gaussian smearing. This is a feature which I'll maybe I mentioned in a moment. You can do even adaptive smearing, but we, we don't do it. We do a fixed smearing of 30 million electron volts. And use a 40 by 40 by 40 mesh, is what it means. You can do also 40 by 50 by 60 if you want, but since it's a system which 40 by 40 by 40 works, there's a shortcut. You can just say 40, it means a cubic 40 by 40 by 40 cube. So these uh, six lines are about density of states. Um, one thing to I wanted to just to mention, if you go in the paper of uh, Jonathan and co-workers, which I mentioned before, they also introduce a concept of adaptive smearing, which is essentially the fact that if you have a band which is almost flat, uh, if you go from one k-point to the next one, you need a very small smearing because in the end, uh, your band will be essentially flat. If your band is very dispersive, it's very high derivative, so it has a high velocity, you might want to use in that point a much higher smearing because in the end, you know, going from one point to the next one will have essentially change a lot of energy. And so this adaptive smearing is something which has been described in the paper and is implemented in Boltzmann. It would allow you to have a smearing amplitude, which depends point by point, and allows you to essentially have, with a relatively coarse grid, a relatively smooth density state. If you want to try, you know, have the example, you can just try to play with the smearing width and adaptive smearing to be true or false and you look at the density of states. But that's not the main point of this tutorial, so I will just, I just mention it. The other important part is the actual parameters for uh, Boltzmann. And first of all, the same K-mesh will be used to compute the transport distribution function, oh, sorry, uh, the transport distribution function. So we are computing this on a 40 by 40 by 40 mesh. Uh, you can put a smearing, but I suggest actually not to, uh, unless you are at a very low temperature because it typically introduces artificial effects. And since you don't want to show sigma, but you want to integrate sigma, it's better not to put any smearing to have the quantitative correct quantity. But in case there is also a Boltz uh, TDF smearing uh, parameter. Instead, what you want to say is in which range of chemical potentials and in which range of temperatures you want to compute. And these are specified by a minimum, a maximum value, and a step. So this would compute between uh, five and eight electron volts, every 10 million electron volts your, uh, for, for the move, for the chemical potential. And you need to know where the Fermi level is. So you want to be around the Fermi level, of course. And in this case, I want to get only a 300 Kelvin. So what I do is I say min and max is 300 Kelvin. So this step is useless. But if I wanted to do 300, 500, 700, I could have said 300 here, maximum 700 step of 200. So it goes 300, 500, 700. And finally, you need, of course, a relaxation time, tau, in, in uh, femtoseconds. seconds. And this option is commented, as you see. You want to say how many states you have on each band. Essentially, this is typically understood by default by uh, Bunny 90 if it's if you have a spin unpolarized system, it's two, you have spin up and spin down. If you do spin orbit, you want to put one because you have explicitly uh, both bands. But let's see, let's say all the inputs. So essentially, apart from activating it, if you want computing the DOS and saying which range of uh, new and temperature you want to compute uh, and relaxation time, let's say input. You run it, and what you get in the output are files, which essentially allow you to plot the density of states of your material. It's a silicon density of states, it's uh, the gap. And for instance, here I'm plotting the civil coefficient as a function of my limited E, but in reality, this is a chemical potential, okay? You will, so you will see, so you, you know where it is, maybe I show you quickly, but it's in the usual uh, GitHub. Um, let's just go there. So you go in a 2022.05, we go in day five morning Boltzmann. You will find the usual file, okay? So SCF, NSCF, PL2090, and the Vanier input, which contains what I just showed you, plus the standard things for uh, um, for silicon. So the bottom part you should know exactly, and this top part is what I just described. And there is a tutorial you can just follow. 
which explains exactly what you have to do. Okay, so it's a few pages. In principle, in 10 minutes, you should be almost, you should be able to get to this final plot. What I wanted to tell you is that there are a number of uh, uh, ideas, and actually, by the way, let me thank also Jung Feng who helped me a lot for this tutorial, uh, and will be there to help, but the, there is a number of interesting things is that the simulation is really putting the numbers and pressing enter. Try to think a bit uh, to what you can do. And there are a few suggestions of what you can do, which I put also here. This is my last slide. First of all, think looking back at the equations I showed, uh, maybe I'll give a link to the slides, um, why the CB coefficient in this approximation is independent of the relaxation time, while sigma and k are the linear proportional essentially. So that's one exercise, more mathematical. And question, is this true even beyond the constant of relaxation time? Second thing, you can change the k-mesh. These are relatively fast calculations. So you can see 20, 40, 60, how much these functions change. Third thing, you can try to learn how to plot as a function of temperature, either multiple runs or a single run specifying multiple temperatures. As I mentioned, the expensive part is typically the transport distribution function. So if you take this input and you run it once, and then you change here 500, 500, run it again, it will take a lot of time. It has to recompute the transport distribution function. So one trick would be to put really 300, 700, 200, you will see that the time spent for it is written at the bottom. The time spent for the transit distribution function is the largest part. Then an interpolation on multiple temperatures is very fast, it's probably 10% uh, of the calculation. So actually a suggestion would be to try to do it in a single calculation and compare the time. And finally, finally, as I mentioned before, experimentally you have not, you cannot measure the chemical potential, but you measure the doping of the material. So try to, to imagine, you won't be able to in 15 minutes, but try at least to imagine how you would convert this plot. So this, not as a function of the chemical potential, but as a function of the doping, as I showed before. With this, I uh, stop. I will let you go through this short tutorial. And you, of course, you can look at it also later if you don't have time, but it, will, it should be short. And I'm happy to take any questions maybe live now. and. Uh, um, or on the matrix chart. So maybe, I don't know if there are, I, I'm gonna look maybe through the chat, maybe you can, okay. uh, Auntie Mark, who's there, can check if there are questions there. Thank the, you for your attention. Thank, thanks, Giovanni. I think we, we should all thank our speakers. <laughs> thanks, Giovanni, for the, for the very nice talk. So I noticed, I think, a couple of questions online. Uh, we can start with the first one. Is there any possibility of having interband terms sum over n and m in the transport coefficient definitions. So I think, uh, let's go here. This one, right? Um, so I think, that, no, I mean, if you write it down, the, let's say, in, it depends on which approximation you make on tau. Okay, so, let me take this otherwise. Uh, here we made a very simple approximation where actually you put this as a constant. So essentially, wherever you are on the bands, you have a constant time. If you already now say, okay, what I can compute is given a band, I compute the scattering on all other bands and then give a time for scattering out of the state in any other state, still you're in a lucky case where uh, the sum will still be on one band and you have a tau which depends on the band. You might have a something more complex, you really want a very advanced model in which you have scattering between bands and you consider a pair of bands. But it, it's a simplest approximation. This is the correct equation even at interband states. There, there was another question, why there is a maxima and a minima for the CB coefficient versus energy plot for silicon? Yeah, that's a typical shape of a CB coefficient uh, as a function. Again, this is not the, it's an energy in the sense is the position of the chemical potential. And when you have a semiconductor and a band, uh, you can make simple models. Actually, it will be an, yeah, an exercise I give you actually is to take a parabolic band, very simple, okay? So E equal to H bar uh, squared, K squared over two M, a mass. And you try to uh, analytically derive what's the expression of sigma and S, and you need, you need both, uh, when you have to invert this matrix in one dimension maybe for sigma and s when your band is parabolic so you know the density of states 
if you do it, you will see that the shape uh, uh, essentially as, as this one. So you will have something which goes up and then goes down. That's the kind of standard shape for, for this function. And actually, this is what makes uh, complicated to optimize uh, this product ZT sigma s squared over k because s and k already are kind of connected. If you increase, you see, you see it here. When sigma is high, also k is high. When sigma is low, also k is low. So the ratio already is typically zero and it's constant in a sense. You cannot really optimize it. And you need to make an interplay to, because when this goes up, your CBA coefficient goes to zero. So you really have a very narrow range of doping where you have a non-zero sigma, but also relatively large S. If you multiply these two, you get a peak. Okay. Uh, is there, okay, there is one question here. So, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, for topological materials, we know that the, um, we have to correct the Boltzmann equations of motions uh, with a corrective factor. And also the transport properties uh, takes this factor. Um, is the, can we put this uh, corrective factor into the formulas for the integral um, in the code? Yeah. Oh, thanks for the, for the very nice question. So I have to say I'm not an expert. So maybe other people in the room might answer better than me. Let's say if there are such corrections, in, in the, these are not put, there's no correction in the code. The, the equation which are uh, shown here uh, are the ones which are implemented. Uh, but the Volkswagen code in the end uh, is a bit optimized, but in the end the code is relatively simple. So if you have any correction, it's easy to put it into the code. But uh, I have to admit I'm not an expert of uh, transport in, in topological materials. Maybe someone else can also be able to answer better than me. We have another question. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask uh, here uh, in this code, the uh, mean time is a parameter and how can you compute it? You will see it uh, this afternoon, I think, in the EPW. So the typical, the, say if you have a, so the tau is the typical time it takes an electron to scatter out of a state into something else. Now, it depends on your material and the purity of it. If you can have, of course, scattering with impurities. You have an electron and there's a doping itself, for instance, and it will scatter your electrons. And so you can take out, for instance, um, approximate, you can work them out, but very often it's easiest to take a approximate function which tells you, given a concentration of impurities, what is the scattering rate. Uh, you can have other scattering options, but one intrinsic one I cannot remove with the scattering of electrons with phonons. And so you need a code which is able to compute the electron phonon scattering, like EPW we we'll see this afternoon, which is able exactly to compute this tau as a function of n and k. So this would be a way to, to get the actual number. So I'm not sure if this is gonna be part of the tutorial, maybe Roxana or someone can say, but uh, this, the EPW code can, uh, uh, can compute this. Maybe Roxana is going Actually, to yeah, thanks that you mentioned that because Roxana, I think, is at the, the Adriatico. In Samuel's tutorial, you will, you're going to see that, the Great. second tutorial. And so just uh, now you see the easy one and then later we see the advanced one. Yeah. <laughs> so Gio Giovanni, maybe you can go to the previous slide to, to, yeah. to answer this also. I, this one? No, the one where, the one where, you, where you explained that, you know, there are two components, uh, do two thermoconductivities uh, somehow. That's also related to that. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, where are we? Wait a second, I got lost. Yeah, ah, here. Yeah, so there, if you want, here at the bottom, in reality, you have the sum of, so you, you have the total thermal conductivity of the system. Uh, you have really to sum all contribution. You have addition, let's say, you have a contribution which is phonon phonon interaction, and you have a contribution which is electron with something else, okay? And these are electrons which are just transferring heat because they are moving. And as I said, we are computing only this, so electron will be hot. And we move through the system, we not only transfer charge, but we also transfer some heat. Within it uh, itself, this Ke is a sum as a weighted sum of all the possible transport uh, scattering contributions in the material. And you don't see it here, but 
one is electron phonon and one is uh, uh, you know, electron impurity, one could be electron uh, boundary of the, of the actual sample and so on. So when the electron phonon, you see the electron is still part of this. And then the KL is really phonon phonon interaction. Great. Are there any other questions? If not... Can I ask a follow-up follow question on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, please. So can you go to the slide with the tau k, which is not a constant? Yeah. Uh, this one? Yeah, so I'm wondering, so if I have an electron with k, let's say it's moving to the right, and then if that electron scatters off of something, shouldn't you also keep track of where that electron scattered? Because if it continues going to the right, then it still carries, you know, energy, heat, whatever. Yeah, you're, you're totally but, right. And uh, indeed, we, the, the actual equation would take into account uh, initial and final state. Uh, and uh, it kind of goes back to the previous question. And uh, matrix, so in the case of phonon, electron phonon matrix elements between these two, because you, you also have to have maybe the rate would depend if you have a phonon with that k, your q vector, and that energy difference. So yes, in general, it's true. But you know, the point is, can we make a simple model? What are the approximations we can make to make it, uh, to get an approximate model? And so you can go from a fully ab initio, you compute all the phonons, you do what do you do in the afternoon, to say, okay, given a state, on average, I know where it goes and get a eight time, which would tell me roughly how this can turn out, to a constant, which is very rough, but gives you a qualitative sense of what, in many cases, what's going on. Okay, so that's totally right, and in the, in the, the, the heat you have to try to separate in two. This is even more important for a phonon phonon. You have a contribution which is uh, elastic, where in a sense you continue, you, you scatter, but you continue transferring the heat, so it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect. And you have the inelastic contribution where you actually, in a sense, you send it back if you want to. You, you have a reciprocal lattice vector which connects the initial and the final state, and this really affects a lot of the, the thermal conductivity. Okay, so you, so you would basically kind of average that out, and then the, the equation, but the equation would still have the same form. We would only have to. Well, no, or I think the equation becomes more more complicated if you because here you see I have, well, where is it? Here I'm really making assumptions on the shape of this that the derivative of f with collisions, and this will allow me, allow me to simplify a lot uh, everything. But if, if in reality this is a complex thing, uh, then. Uh, you do not necessarily get uh, something which is relatively simple. You, you will end up with also some of initial and, and final states. This tau enters here with some delta on the difference of k vectors, the difference in energy, and mm. the initial it's final like state, and the, g, and the g square coefficient of electron phonon scattering. So it's like a double sum then, or k? Okay, good. Sure. Double sum and more delta factors. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so I guess there is five, six minutes left. Uh, Probably we should uh, just let people work in the tutorial, or what do you think, Giovanni? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know what the timing for the lunch is, but indeed maybe we can leave people at least to give a look at the tutorial yeah, and these questions, and you can ask questions directly in Matrix. I would say we reuse the Vanier 90 tutorial room, uh, since yeah. it's also part of Vanier 90. So in five minutes, it doesn't make sense to make a new room. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, we have this uh, Matrix <coughs> channel. Please use that to ask technical questions. This is especially true if you are uh, connected through the Zoom. Well, if you are here in presence, you can still raise your hand. I will bring you. We will bring you the microphone. Thank you. 
So since there is a question in the chat, maybe I'll read it out loud for everybody and try to answer from Libor. <coughs> so I, <coughs> I mentioned indeed the possibility to interpolate not only um, the, the, the Hamiltonian, so the bands and the velocity, but also other operators. Um, so this, let's say, is not described in the manual in the sense that it's not something where you can really pass a file and it gets interpolated. But it's very easy if you want a little bit of Fortran to go in. And essentially, as long as you can give matrix elements of that operator with respect to the states uh, in the, the, the conscious state, typically, then it's very easy to use the same routines for free interpolating. Uh, for instance, for all the spin properties, which are a lot of spin uh, modules, which we didn't show today in the post 90 these are all using the same approach. So you interpolate also the spin matrix elements. But um, you need the, all the, the, the DFT code to compute also some additional matrix elements with the spin. So you need, but the advantage again is you do this on a coarse grid and then when you have to interpolate it everywhere. So if you're interested in a specific operator, you should, unless it's something simple like a derivative, which means multiplying by R, you need to first implement something in the PWA90 and then change it with the uh, PWA90, let's say, to interpolate. I hope this answers the question. <laughs> Yes. I thought it was going to be nice, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, like, it was like, I tried to pull it out, but it was like, I Yeah, I found some left and I but then they were coming back. Happy or not. Because, you know, they had to leave. But the idea, they, 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 they